Hey, uh, welcome to this uh, lecture in our course on mechanical operations. So in the last uh, lecture, we started talking about the first mechanical operation per se, which is synthesis of uh, nanoparticles, particularly from a top-down approach. Um, again, the difference is that in a bottom-up approach, you start with smaller atoms and nuclei and build them up to larger nanoparticles, whereas in the top-down approach, you start with micron-sized particles and fragment them into nano-sized particles. So uh, we have so far been discussing the bottom up methods. So we'll continue that and then uh, we will transition into the top down methods. So the next uh, bottom up method is chemical vapor synthesis. There is a process called chemical vapor deposition or CVD which is very widely used in semiconductor and microelectronics industries. In fact, I teach a separate course on that which is also an NPTEL course. The way chemical vapor deposition works, you generate vapors and you, uh, you make the vapor condense on a hot substrate where it forms a film. So the difference between chemical vapor deposition and physical vapor deposition is in, in PVD or physical vapor deposition, the condensed film has the same composition as the vapor phase precursor. For example, if you want to condense a silicon film and you are using silicon vapor, that's called physical vapor deposition. But if you're trying to condense a silicon film, but the vapor phase has many, many species containing silicon like uh, SiH4, SiH2Cl3, Cl2, SiHCl3, uh, SiO2. But the film only has silicon. That's called chemical vapor deposition because you are utilizing chemical reactions in the gas phase to produce that silicon film. And you're also using transport phenomena associated with these many different vapor species that are present. Okay. So in CVD, the whole challenge is not to allow condensation to happen anywhere in the reactor except on the substrate on which you are trying to grow a film. In, but you can use the same reactor to synthesize nanoparticles. And the way you do that is that you actually allow the, um, the reactor to have condensation conditions not only at a target substrate but many places within the reactor. And so vapor phase nucleation of particles is actually preferred over film deposition on surfaces. You have to design the thermodynamics and the kinetics of the system in such a way that gas phase nucleation happens rather than heterogeneous condensation on a solid surface. So when you do that, the reactor is now called chemical vapor condensation or chemical vapor synthesis reactor. And it's basically a, a system in which um, you know, the, the, the particles, instead of being formed only on the substrate, they're actually being formed in the gas phase. And then the particles are transported to a collector. So the transport phenomena changes from being vapor transport to particle transport. And the collection process changes from being condensation to all the other transport mechanisms we have discussed, diffusion, interception, impingement, impaction and so on. So this is a method to produce nanoparticles, a very flexible method. You can basically tune the operating conditions, temperature, pressure, reacting species, concentrations, and you can make any nanomaterial you want. There is a large database of chemistries that have been developed for CVD process which can now be applied for CVS or chemical vapor synthesis. The precursors can be solid, liquid or gas under ambient conditions. But before you introduce them into the CVD reactor, they have to be transformed into vapor form. So what enters a CVS reactor or a CVD reactor can only be in vapor form. You cannot introduce solids or liquids. So some of the examples of nanoparticles that can be made by this process, oxide coated silicon, tungsten nanoparticles by de decomposing tungsten and hexacarbonyl, copper and Cu2O3 nanoparticles. It's very easy to incorporate various chemistries. For example, if you want to make copper, you don't allow oxygen into the reactor. If you want to make copper oxide, you allow oxygen as one of the reactants into the reactor. So it's very easy to control the, the chemistry of the um, nanoparticles. Spray pyrolysis 
is a technique that again uses the fact that extremely fine droplets are also extremely reactive. So you use something called a nebulizer to prepare very, very small droplets of a solution and then you inject these into a, a pyrolysis reactor which then induces a reaction to take place in the droplets and after that, so you form the aerosols or particles by the um, high temperature induced chemical reactions within the droplets. The droplets are themselves made of, made up of solvents, evaporate the solvents and what is left are the nanoparticles that you have produced. For example, uh, TiO2 and copper can be produced using this method. Similarly, laser pyrolysis also takes a precursor heated by having a, a laser impaction on the surface and this allows localized heating and, and rapid cooling. So the, the difference between laser methods compared to the thermal methods is that in a thermal method it's the whole material evaporates whereas with laser you can uh, allow the vaporization to happen from localized areas. Use an infrared CO2 laser. Um, so you can make silicon here from silane and, and so on. Pulse laser is a variation on this which can shorten the reaction times and allow preparation of even finer particles. Thermal plasma, again very similar to what we have discussed earlier except that the, uh, the gas phase is a plasma. A plasma obviously is more reactive because it uh, carries a charge and it, um, it enhances reaction rates and uh, again the precursors are quickly decomposed into atoms because of uh, the reactivity of the plasma and then you cool it or condense it to make particles. You can make silicon carbide and tungsten carbide, titanium carbide using this method. Flame synthesis, here you are actually using combustion reactions to produce the high temperatures, the heat and you, synth you synthesize the particles in the flame itself. So you inject aerosols, liquid aerosols into the flame and you actually form the particles by burning these droplets. This is the most commercially viable approach and there are millions of tons of uh, carbon black and metal oxides using this process. It is a little complex process to control because combustion by definition is not a very rep repeatable and reproducible process. So you may not get the same for example distribution of particle sizes every time you run this process and control is difficult. But it is a good process for making oxides for example Fe203 nanoparticles, titania, silica and so on. Flame spray pyrolysis, it is a combination of flame pyrolysis and spray pyrolysis where you inject the droplets in the form of a very fine spray into the flame and then again use the temperature or the heat of the flame to vaporize the, the solvent. Low temperature reactive synthesis, there are certain materials that cannot withstand high temperatures. So in such cases you have to keep the temperatures low, you cannot allow heat to be generated in the system. For example, uh, is it in, uh, selenium nanoparticles from dimethyl zinc, trimethylamine and uh, hydrogen selenide, you use um, just enough heat of reaction to crystallize the particles. So the particles here form by the mechanism of low temperature crystallization. And the last process from a bottom up viewpoint is sonochemical nanosynthesis. Sonochemistry is something that happens when you, when you couple a chemical reaction to a high intensity acoustic field. The cavitation phenomena actually acoustic cavitation that happens in these fields can break down chemical bonds. They can transform particularly larger molecules into finer molecules and that, as that happens again the reactivity increases. So when you couple any chemical reaction to an uh, acoustic field it can run much faster. It intensifies the process by several orders of magnitude. Um, and also in cavitation during the implosion of the bubble you get extremely high temperatures in the solution which can be of the order of 5000 to 25000 Kelvin. In fact people are trying to achieve what they call tabletop fusion by using sonochemistry. Um, there is a theory that you can actually produce fusion energy on a just in an acoustic, um, acoustic field. So, so you take advantage of the fact that cavitation breaks bonds and produces very high temperatures 
to promote chemical reactions and form product. And also uh, once a product is formed all you have to do is turn off the acoustic field and it quenches the reaction. So you can truncate the reaction wherever you want it. So it has that benefit as well. It is a good process particularly for amorphous products and there is also a high level of um, convective transport that happens in these acoustic fields. So you can insert or incorporate nanomaterials into small porosities in a larger material, nanomaterials into mesoporous materials. You can deposit nanoparticles on ceramic and polymer surfaces. So there are several advantages to this technique. Some of the um, examples of materials that are made using this technique are listed here. All right, so let us now transition into the top down regime which is probably most relevant for this course. When we talk about breakdown of particles and this is something we will deal with in more detail later on in this course, I just want to talk about it in the context of nanoparticle synthesis right now. There are various types of size reduction machines that are used in industry. Now, in the larger sizes you have crushers that can take boulders and break them down into smaller rocks and pebbles and so on. There are various types of crushers and then there are the grinders which deal with particles in a finer size range. Uh, these are typically mills, hammer mill, rolling mill, attrition mill, tumbling mill which is also known as a ball mill and you have ultra fine grinders. Once you get down to sizes below which grinding or milling becomes ineffective, there are these ultra fine grinders that use fluid energy and so on to grind even finer. And finally you have cutting machines which uh, essentially do uh, size reduction in one plane. A ball mill again you will deal with this much more extensively in this course as well as in the lab that you will do next semester. I am sure you have all seen ball mills. You know it is basically uh, a chamber in which you have the material loaded whose size you want to reduce and you fill it with some media and the size reduction happens when the media which is tumbling in the mill drop on top of the material whose size you are trying to reduce and cause size reduction to happen. So the mechanism here is that as the mill rotates it has to carry the particles as close to the top as possible and then let them drop so that you maximize the kinetic energy of impact between the media and the material that uh, you are trying to grind. So the uh, speed of the ball mill is very critical. You want to operate it at a speed where the balls will get taken all the way to the top and dropped but at the same time you do not want the speed to be so high that it will just keep following the, the rotation of the mill, right. So there is something called critical speed that has to be derived and controlled. In fact, the, normally a ball mill will be operated at about 75 percent of this critical speed just to give us a safety margin. But the mechanism again is impaction between media and the particle. So you have a cylindrical shell slowly turns about a horizontal axis filled about half its volume with some solid grinding medium. The grinding medium itself can be metallic or it can be ceramic or it can be plastic, can be operated in continuous mode or batch mode. The reduction is by impaction of the media against the material that you are trying to size reduce. The force is acting inside the ball mill, there is a centrifugal force which lifts the everything along the walls and the gravity force which causes the ball to drop on the feed material. Uh, I mentioned that there is a critical speed and um, you know, it is an expression that relates NC which is a critical speed of the ball mill to acceleration due to gravity, the radius of the shell and radius of individual balls. So you can actually derive this uh, critical speed for um, every filling condition and like I said you would like to operate the ball mill around 75 percent of this critical speed. This can actually be derived from first principles. So industrial applications, um, virtually any chemical processing industry will have ball mills. So it is really the workhorse as far as size reduction industry is concerned particularly in the finer sizes. What are the limitations to this technique? It is a high power consuming technology and uh, particularly as the size gets smaller the efficiency of size reduction will quickly drop. But mineral processing industry, cement industry, coal processing are all examples of industries that rely almost entirely on ball mills. 
just to give you a, a feel for the scale, there are, these are huge equipment. If you go to industry, you know, it's not going to be this, the kind of stuff you're going to see in the lab when you do the experiment. There are going to be massive equipment that are grinding tons of materials, sometimes continuously 24 by 7. There is a variation of this called high energy ball milling. So in a high energy ball mill, the difference between a high energy ball mill and a regular ball mill is that in a high energy ball mill, you can control the environment. You can control the temperature inside the mill, you can control the pressure, you can apply vacuum if you want, you can apply high pressures if you want and also you can introduce a chemistry into the ball mill. You can actually have reactive species entering the ball mill and causing chemical and structural changes to happen even while the ball milling process is, um, is going on. So this is what a high energy ball mill looks like. Uh, inside you will see that you can actually provide an environment. You can have an inert environment by filling with argon for example or you can have various types of um, reactive materials as well. So this table compares ball milling to high energy ball milling. In a ball mill you will see that a typical milling time is, is of the order of an hour or less. In a high energy ball mill uh, some of them can operate for 20 to 200 hours on one feed because you are trying to, in a high energy ball mill, you are trying to reduce particles to a much finer size compared to a regular ball mill. The impact energy is designed to be much larger in a high energy ball mill compared to a normal ball mill and that is typically done by providing a larger chamber, heavier balls higher speed of rotation before the particles drop. So the particle size that you can achieve actually interestingly in both cases is of the order of microns when you take the product out but that is because in a high energy ball mill there is significant agglomeration happening. So even though the size may be in microns it is because particles are clustered. If you break them apart you will find that they are much much finer than microns. So it is possible to achieve nano sizes in a high energy ball mill. Structural changes are not possible in a routine ball mill, they are possible in a high energy ball mill. Chemical reactions are not allowed in a regular ball mill, they are incorporated into a high energy ball mill. And like I said the pressure and temperature can also be controlled. In fact uh, in terms of temperature it is not just that you go to high temperatures in a high energy ball mill, you can even get to very low temperatures by for example by using liquid nitrogen you can achieve you know very very low temperatures if you want to make the material more brittle. One of the chief requirements for size reduction by ball milling or even by other methods that we will talk about is that the material has to be very fragile so that it, it breaks easily and immersing materials, if you, if you take a ductile material and immerse it in a um, solvent like liquid or any cryogenic liquid you can make it brittle and so that is that can be applied in high energy ball mills. There are also vibrating ball mills, again we will talk about this in more detail uh, later on, which can also be used to produce fine particles starting from larger particles. So this could be another mechanism to make nanoparticles where you use vibrational energy of the ball to do this uh, commu comminution which is another word for size reduction. So what are the limit, how, how small a size can you get to with, with um, ball milling? There is a size limitation and there are two reasons for it. When the particle diameter becomes smaller than say 50 nanometers, you, the, the particles kind of are now are just the crystals. So their strength increases. In fact this is something you will measure in the laboratory as particle size decreases it requires more energy to produce unit surface area. So there is an inverse correlation between the amount of energy required to do size reduction and the size to begin with. And so it is a self limiting mechanism as the particle size gets smaller and smaller you need more and more energy to make it smaller so eventually you reach a plateau as far as the size, the minimum size is concerned. The other problem is the uh, agglomeration or coagulation or aggregation of small particles into coarse clusters. It will become increasingly difficult to keep particles separate, they will start joining and turning into bigger clusters. So there is an inherent or inbuilt limitation 
to how small a particle you can make just by using ball milling. The other problem, I mentioned that you may have to mill for many hours in order to reach the nano sizes. As you do that, what is going to happen to the structure of the particle? You may have started with a particle that is highly you know, crystalline in structure and but as you keep going, you will see that you lose the crystallinity. It becomes more and more amorphous, loses shape, loses structure, which is a problem. You know, if you want to maintain the crystallinity, if you want to maintain the structure, extended ball milling over long periods of time is not good for you. So that is another limitation is that the structure itself changes. So if you take uh, some uh, TEM image of titanium nitride nanoparticles that have been produced by high energy ball milling, you will see this mechanism of clustering. You will see that you know the particles are, are very difficult to observe individually. These clusters are of the order of you know this is 100 nanometers. So this is 100 nanometer crystal cluster, those are 500 to 800 nanometer clusters. So, um, clusters form when you do ball milling. However, you will also see that these are loosely bonded clusters. So it is very easy to break them apart, it is just minimal um, expenditure of energy. So it is not necessarily a big negative, these clusters are easy to take apart. So some examples of uh, milling produced nanoparticles, uh, this is um, you take titanium you can also do this with iron and zirconium and you do high energy ball milling in an oxygen environment, you can actually make nano titanium oxide or nano, nano iron oxide or nano zirconium oxide. And again this is how the morphology looks, clustering happens but do not worry about it. Nanotubes, carbon nanotube for example can be made using um, high energy ball milling, it is actually a two part process. You do high energy ball milling to get the basic structure, but then you use thermal annealing which is basically baking at a high temperature to then cause these um, nanotubes to grow and reach the dimensions that are needed. Because remember a, 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 a nano tube is one that has nano dimensions only in one direction, in the other direction they are pretty long. So you have to have the growth phase in order for the, the growth to the length to happen. So this is how it looks, you, you create the nanotube precursor through ball milling and then you get these precursors to agglomerate and grow into a long tube. So if you look at this method, is it top down or bottom up? Well it is interesting that the mechanical milling part, the first part where you are making the precursors for the nanotube that is clearly top down because you are doing size reduction. However, the second part the thermal annealing is actually a bottom up process because you are taking fragments and actually joining them together to make a nanoparticle. So this is an example of a technique that combines aspects of both top down and bottom up synthesis. Uh, some of the materials that can be made uh, boron nitride uh, nanotubes. In fact, the first commercial source for boron nitride nanotubes was ball milling. You know, there is again this what I call the disconnect between mechanical operations and nanotechnology. There is some of this perception that nanotechnology is high tech and mechanical operations is low tech. But clearly, it is a classic illustration of the fact that uh, you can synthesize nanoparticles using a, a very simple mechanical operation like ball milling. And you can do it very cost effectively compared to. Um, bottom up methods. So there are many, if you look in literature, there are many, many papers that talk about synthesis of nanoparticles using ball milling as a method. But there is a problem here as I mentioned. This is the plateauing effect that I was talking about. If you look at the size that you can achieve and plot as a function of milling time, you will reach an asymptotic limit very quickly and then the size reduction will basically stop. Now you can play with the RPM a little bit going from you know 250 RPM to 300 RPM but that would not affect the minimum size. It will affect how quickly you reach that size 
but it won't affect the minimum size that you can achieve. Energy consumption can also be quite high. It is interesting that energy inefficiency is really high once you reach about 5 microns because with once you reach the 5 micron size energy any additional energy input is not doing anything for you you know it is not doing any more size reduction all that energy is just going to waste. So, what is your alternative? Well, the second technique that we can talk about that causes size reduction to happen and enables nanoparticle synthesis top down is use of acoustic fields. By using this cavitation energy that you get in an acoustic field, you can do size reduction. And if you look, if you look at the size, if you look at the energy consumption in the two cases, you will see that milling, you know, obviously there is a size limitation that you cannot get any smaller. Whereas, with sonication which is uh, an acoustic technique, you can keep reducing size well below what um, milling gives you and the energy consumption is actually significantly reduced as well. So, acoustic techniques actually ball milling is better at the larger sizes. Sonication or acoustic size reduction is not as effective, but once you reach the 5, 6 to 8 micron size range acoustic methods are much better in terms of allowing size reduction to continue as well as uh, in terms of energy efficiency. So, what is this ultrasonication or acoustic pro process we, we have been talking about? When you take uh, an acoustic field um, in the 20 kilohertz and higher range and you couple it to a liquid, you form an acoustic field in the liquid. So, you will have um, compressive and um, rarefaction cycles alternating. So, during the, the compressive or during the rarefaction phase you form bubbles in the solution. During the compression phase the bubbles implode and as the bubbles implode they release huge energies in the form of a shock wave. So, these are the types of bubbles that form and when they implode all the energy that is stored in this bubble is released when, when it implodes and it is this energy that goes out and does your size reduction for you. So, because it is the it is a force that impinges on the particle and causes it to shatter or fragment. Now, this happens at low frequencies low meaning from 20 to 100 kilohertz. If you go above 100 kilohertz cavitation slowly drops off. In fact, cavitation intensity goes roughly as 1 over f cube because it is a volumetric effect the size of the bubble cavitation bubble scales as 1 over frequency. So, the volume scales as 1 over frequency cubed. So, as the frequency increases cavitation intensity drops very rapidly and this other mechanism called acoustic streaming kicks in. Acoustic streaming is just a high velocity flow that is induced by the acoustic field, but uh, the combination of cavitation at low frequencies and acoustic streaming at high frequencies does a lot of good things for you in terms of uh, synthesis and composite formulation using nanoparticles. So, this is the mechanism cavitation bubble grows in the negative pressure phase reaches a maximum size collapse releases energy and then keeps repeating this over and over. So, as I was mentioning if you plot frequency versus cavitation strength there is a 1 over f cube dependence. So, what are some advantages of this technique for making nanoparticles? It is a top down technique, it is a purely mechanical operation in the sense that there is no chemistry involved. You are just taking the particles that you want to size reduce, immersing it in some liquid medium does not have to be a reactive medium in fact, water is typically used as the medium and then you couple it to an acoustic field and the acoustic force is what does your size reduction. So, it is a purely physical process of particle fragmentation, which means that you can achieve very high purity because you are not introducing a lot of chemicals into the system. Every chemical that you introduce there is a potential for some impurity to be introduced along with that chemical. So, by avoiding chemicals you avoid impurities. Energy efficient as we saw scale up is easy you know anytime you talk about a process you have to think about is it manufacturable, is it scalable 
turns out that um, sonication as a way of size reduction is um, commercialized already. There are systems you can buy that can make nanoparticles in tons per day by using this method of uh, sono fragmentation. It is very simple because there is no chemistry involved. All you need is a, a tank with water, an ultrasonic generator, transducer to couple the, um, acu the um, acoustic energy and that is it. So it is a very easy process. It introduces lattice strain and lowers the sintering temperature. Now that can be an advantage or a disadvantage if you if you are trying to sinter a material and you want to minimize energy consumption then um, lowering the sintering temperature helps you. But the fact that uh, the lattice can be influenced could be a potential negative also. Sonication does affect your crystallinity. In fact if you do sonication for a long period of time unlike ball milling you do not get amorphous material you get more crystalline material. So which could again be a plus or a minus depending on your application. So here is some uh, again literature data Michael Koss worked with uh, alumina particles and um, so what he is showing is if you if you look at the diameter of an untreated material compared to after 30 minutes you will see that with the increase of time the fraction of material in the sub 10 micron range keeps increasing. So at 30 minutes you have a fairly substantial amount of material that is showing up in the 1 to 10 micron size range. However, you will see in this data that you are still not producing particles that are less than a micron. So we are, the, the work that he did was interesting in that it showed that um, ultrasonics can induce fragmentation but his data did not really show that you could make nanoparticles. Um, this is work that uh, more clearly shows particle production in the nano range. So this is similar data for silica and you can, here you can see that with the passage of time a fairly distinct peak starts to show up in the 0.1 to 1 micron size range. Now that is nano dimensional right 0.1 microns is um, 100 nanometers. So with, um, with this data we can see that there is some evidence of ability to produce nanoparticles using uh, sono fragmentation and similarly zirconia also shows ability to produce nanoparticles um, in the nano size range I mean it, in the yeah, nano size. So if you take all the literature data and you plot power input versus mean particle diameter that you can achieve you will see that there is basically a, almost a straight line relationship between the two. As you keep increasing the input power of sonication you keep achieving smaller and smaller particle diameters. But again the limitation is in literature there is no data below a micron. So a lot of work even in our lab has focused on how do you extend this, how do you make particles go below the 1 micron size range. And by the way you can also derive a fragmentation rate expression that relates fragmentation rate to parameters such as ultrasonic power input, particle volume and total suspension volume. Now this expression is interesting because it has certain implications about scalability. One thing that it says is power input clearly has an influence the higher the power input the more fragmentation you get. But the interesting thing is well the suspension volume is in the denominator. So the less liquid you have where the particles are suspended the more effective the process is because it is a volumetric effect. We have less liquid power per unit volume is higher so the fragmentation effect is greater. But particle volume is in the numerator and that is the most interesting thing about this expression. It says that the more the concentration of particles in, in the suspension the greater is the fragmentation efficiency. When you think about it that is very beneficial from a, from a scaling up viewpoint. What it says is the more material you put in the better will be the fragmentation efficiency. Usually it goes the other way you know a lot of these systems only work under dilute conditions. As you start concentrating efficiency drops off but in this case it does not and the reason for that is this fragmentation mechanism involves collisions. So the greater the concentration of particles the um, closer particles are to each other and the greater the likelihood that particles will collide with each other. And that is the reason why a higher concentration of particles actually results in 
greater fragmentation efficiency although I should say that this is not a monotonic behavior. If you actually take particle concentration and plot against fragmentation efficiency you will see that it, it will reach a peak and then actually start to decrease. The reason for that is eventually if you keep putting in more and more particles the um, there would not be the cavitation itself will stop happening you know uh, cavitation effects will start to get suppressed. But until you reach that limit you will see that there is a monotonic increase in fragmentation rate as particle concentration increases. This is just a cartoon of how size uh, reduction happens due to sono fragmentation. So you have a system where you have these bubbles and you have particles the bubble explodes or, or implodes and so there are two ways in which the particle can fragment as the bubble collapses it releases a shock wave which goes and impacts on the particle and causes it to shatter or it can actually accelerate one particle and make it collide against its neighboring particle. So both mechanisms are possible and depending on the concentration of particles one mechanism or the other will become predominant. So it can be either bubble to particle impact or particle to particle impact and but the end effect is end result is you get fragmented particles. So the way that you would do this in a laboratory you just take distilled water in a beaker put micron sized particles in it take this beaker with the particles stick it in an ultrasonic tank and um, induce an acoustic field 20 kilohertz 1000 watts and what will happen is that you will see a stratification effect as you do the sonication some particles will start fragmenting they will float to the top some particles will not fragment at all they will stay at the bottom and then there will be a middle layer that consists of partially fragmented particles. So you will quickly see three different layers develop the topmost layer will have the nanoparticles. So if you have a top skimming kind of arrangement you can just pick off those nanoparticles and those become your nanomaterials and then what you can do is the second and third levels you can keep recycling until they also get size reduced to the nano sizes. So you get the stratified mixture of micron size particles at the bottom sub micron plus nano in the middle and nano at the top. You can do other things with it um, for example maybe you do not want a stratified solution you want the micron and the sub micron and the nanoparticles to be well mixed you can do that. So you can take this uh, stratified mixture and stick it in another ultrasonic tank with a higher frequency that will do a very good job of completely blending all these layers so that you become a you obtain a very uniform um, suspension and then you can take this and use it to make composites you know nano composites as we saw in, in, uh, in the last lecture are used in a variety of industries but how do you make a nano composite you have to take nanoparticles and blend them very uniformly into a polymer matrix for example how do you do that how do you achieve that uniformity of mixing it turns out that again nano nano I mean sono technologies are very effective in, in producing these very uniformly blended composite materials. So you can take this um, nanoparticle mixture and prepare a, a polymer precursor by dissolving it in, in a solvent and then mix the two. So you take the solvent um, you take the, the um, polymer you put the nanoparticles in it and you do high frequency sonication what will happen is you may start with a polymer matrix that looks like this after some uh, exposure to an acoustic field it will look like this where the nanoparticles have now been embedded into the polymer matrix. So you know you can imagine this kind of as a two stage process you use low frequency cavitational acoustic fields to synthesize nanoparticles and then you use high frequency acoustic fields to blend the nanoparticles into a polymer that you are trying to make a nano composite of and you can uh, the property enhancements you will see for example erosion resistance will be much better when you have a blended polymer versus a virgin polymer. So we have laboratory now laboratory we have some nice ultrasonic systems you can go take a look at there are two types of ultrasonics there is a tank type and there is a probe type so you can have a tank with uh, liquid in it 
where the transducers are mounted on, on the tank and the acoustic field is generated that way or you can take a nozzle that, that delivers ultrasonic energy as well. And you can do the analysis using various um, particle size analyzers, particle counters, again we have many of these in our laboratories. If you look at our data, there is clearly uh, evidence that we have been able to reduce sizes well into the nano range. We can go below 0.1 microns in terms of the particle size distribution. This is some data on that we obtained in, in our laboratory. There are some interesting things you will see as fragmentation happens. Uh, color changes when particle size reduces. So if you have a suspension with micron size particles, they will have a very, very different color compared to the suspension with the same particles but in nano sizes. And in fact, it will keep getting darker and darker because the light transmission characteristics change. So you, you can actually track color as an indicator of how effectively particles are being size reduced. I mentioned that particle concentration has a non-monotonic uh, effect on size reduction. You can see that in the, the top curve that shows what percentage of particles are below submicron sizes. And you will see that as, feed, as particle concentration increases, it, the, there is a maximum value of, of particle concentration at which maximum size reduction happens and then the efficiency actually starts to drop. And again because frequency has an inverse effect on cavitation, as frequency increases, sonar fragmentation will decrease. Whereas power has a linear effect, as ultrasonic power increases, fragmentation rate will keep increasing. Time again has a non-monotonic effect, typically the mean size will keep decreasing as, as time increases, however agglomeration can cause particles to rejoin, but there are things you can do like addition of surfactant which will prevent particles from agglomerating and therefore maintain the size reduction efficiency with time. So again we can look at optical microscopy images, TEM images all showing evidence that we are able to achieve nano sizes using acoustic techniques. Let me see how many more do we have. All right, so uh, the other interesting thing, thing that happens with sonar fragmentation is particles become more spherical. Acoustic fields have a way of machining off the rough edges. So if you track sphericity which you recall is an indicator of shape, particles tend to become more and more spherical as you um, expose them to an acoustic field. So in addition to size reduction, you are also making the particles more spherical which again has certain advantages or disadvantages depending on your application. So more high resolution TEM pictures showing that we can make nanoparticles using this um, size reduction method. These are alumina particles. All right, so let us stop at that point. In the next class, we will talk about how do you scale this process up? Is it as a mechanical operation? Is it something that you can only do in the lab or can you actually make large quantities by doing it in industry as well? Any questions? Okay, so I will see you in the quiz tomorrow. <laughs>